There is a very significant passage found in Proverbs 14 and verse 12, which says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Now that indicates that a man can be altogether persuaded that what he believes and practices in religion is acceptable to God and will cause him to be saved eternally. Whereas the truth of the matter is, he's simply deceived. You know, we hear all kinds of things about God and about religion. For instance, there are people who are called atheists. Now, an atheist is a person who holds that he knows that God does not exist. He holds, there's no doubt about it, that he actually has the fact which prove that God does not exist. On the other hand, there are those who call themselves agnostics. Now, they claim that there is some evidence for and some evidence against the existence of God, but that no man can really know which one is right. Some people say there is evidence in favor of God, and that evidence is more probable than the evidence against the existence of God. In other words, they're saying it's more probable that God exists than that he does not. While there are other people who say that it's more probable that he does not exist than that he does. But now today, I want to talk about something that is a little more prevalent in our society at least. And that is the idea that one is uh, saved, he's acceptable to God, simply upon the basis that he's sincere in his religion. We look in our nation and we see more than 300 denominations. These people practice different things. They hold to different doctrines, many of which are contradictory not only of their own doctrines, but of the doctrines of other people. And yet the general sentiment is, among our society, is that all of these people are pleasing to God upon the simple basis that they are sincere. In other words, they hold, if one is sincere in religion, then he will be saved. He'll be saved by Jesus Christ. They will be, the basic idea behind this whole thing is that truth is really not important at all. That what is important, and it is the one and only thing that's important, is that one is sincere. Now, as we look at this matter, I want to ask the question, or to point out the fact that many people accept this idea that being sincere is sufficient, that it's all that's really needed in religion. Here we have a man behind a lectern, he's preaching, and he's saying to his audience, just be sincere and you will be, sincere, and you will be saved. I sometimes have pointed out to people what the Bible teaches about certain things, and their response is, but the people who believe that are sincere. Now let me emphasize that no one can be pleasing to God if he is not sincere. There are many places in the Bible which strongly condemn hypocrisy. To be a hypocrite is to pretend to be something but not really be that. To be a hypocrite in religion is to pretend to really love God and the Lord Jesus Christ, but not do so. It's just like acting. A person may act as if he were the King Henry VIII, but he knows well and good that he is not. He's just playing a part. Now, we know in religion people accept this. Many people do. But the question is, does God accept it? And I want to affirm here in no unequivocal terms that God does not accept it. Now, I want to try to persuade you to see that the Bible teaches that. That just being sincere, while sincerity is necessary, you can't be saved without it, it is not sufficient. So, to help us to see that point, I want to raise the question, who will accept the idea that sincerity alone is sufficient in realms other than religion? For instance, how many of us, if we go to a medical doctor, if we go to a physician, will accept the idea that just being sincere is sufficient? Now we have the little cartoon on the chart, and here we have the doctor saying to the patient, were you sincere when you swallowed this poison? You see, here's the fellow who's very ill. He swallowed poison. The doctor's holding the bottle in which it's contained. Here we have the patient making a mistake. And the patient says, yes, I sincerely thought that it was a vitamin pill. Now what sort of reaction will the doctor make to that? Will he say, oh well, if you're sincere, then everything's okay? Well, we've drawn the uh, cartoon here as if he would say that. Here we have the doctor saying, well, if you were sincere when you swallowed that poison thinking it was a vitamin pill, then the poison will not hurt you. 
And we have the patient saying, I understand, doctor. Here he is on the way to death, and the doctor telling him that everything's okay. There isn't anybody in the world, I'm sure, no one in his right mind who is listening to me at this moment who would accept that idea that the sincerity of the patient, the man who swallowed the poison, that sincerity would change the poison into a vitamin pill. It simply won't do it, and we all know it. Now let's look a little further. Now we want to look at the point when the doctor makes a wrong diagnosis. I have great respect for physicians. I appreciate very much the work they do. But I've been to physicians when they made a wrong diagnosis of my case. And I've been with other people, and I know about such situations where doctors made the wrong diagnosis. And so here we have this fellow, he's in bed and he's sick, and he says, Doctor, if you were sincere when you made that diagnosis, I know I will be okay. And we have the doctor saying, yes, sincere doctors make the, the diagnosis acceptable. Why there isn't anybody that believes that? That's just a cartoon. That doesn't happen. There are no patients, unless they're simply insane, who believe that a doctor being sincere will change a wrong diagnosis into a right one. Suppose this man has a malignancy, and the doctor says, well, I think you have a bad cold, and he gives him the medicine for that. Does his sincerity, does the sincerity of this doctor change his wrong diagnosis into a right one? Why, we know that it won't do it. Sincerity won't do that. What about pharmacy? Suppose you've been to a doctor, and he gives you a prescription, and you take it to the, to the pharmacist. And we have here this fellow, now he's talking to the pharmacist, and he says, it really makes no difference how you fill this prescription for my doctor so long as you're sincere. And then you have the pharmacist saying, yes, sincerity is all that matters. That's not so. There are not any people, there are not any patients who take uh, prescriptions to pharmacists who think it doesn't matter what he puts in the bottle. He could put several ingredients in that bottle that would be absolutely poisonous and kill you within a few moments. And his being sincere will not change that. We all know that. What about butchers? Here's a fellow goes to the butcher. Here he is at the meat market, and he says to the, to the butchers, he's wrapped up a package of, of meat here, and he says, say, butcher, is that dog, is that dog meat you're giving me? And the, and the butcher says, well, it doesn't matter. I'm sincere in what I'm doing. Would you believe that? If you had some suspicion that a certain uh, butcher shop was dealing out dog meat instead of beef, would you simply say, well, if he's sincere, then it'll turn that dog meat into, uh, into beef? And you ask the butcher, well, are you sincere? And he says, yes. So you just take his word and say, well, okay, I'll just take it. I know that it would, even if it were dog meat at the beginning, that his sincerity would turn it into beef. You don't believe that. I don't believe it. You can't find any sane person that believes it. Now we have here a man who's a criminal. He's been involved in a lot of crime. And uh, we want to see about the relationship of lawyers and sincerity. And so here this man who is uh, a hardened criminal, and he's talking about a particular circumstance, and he asks the lawyer, did I violate the law? And the lawyer says, in our cartoon, of course, well, if you were sincere in what you did, it really doesn't matter. Why, well, a man that would say that wouldn't be worthy of the name lawyer. Men who have committed murder, men who have held up men, men who have been guilty of rape and other venous, uh, t serious crimes, uh, do not change that crime into a good action by simply being sincere. We all know that. What about farmers? Here's one farmer. He's talking to another farmer. And he says, I wanted to harvest the watermelons, but I planted onion seed. Sincerely believing. In other words, I believe that what I was planting was um, onion seed that, that was watermelon. I, I wanted to harvest a watermelon, but I planted onion seeds, sincerely believing that they were watermelon seed. And so the other farmer says to him in our cartoon, well, as long as you were sincere, you will get watermelon from those onion seeds. Now, I grew the first few years of my life on a farm, and I wasn't very old before I knew better than that. The Bible teaches that every seed brings forth after its kind. There's not anybody in my audience and not anybody in the whole wide world that has ever gotten watermelon from onion seed. And the sincerity of the man who planted the seed does not change it. You see, it's good to be sincere. To be a good person, you have to be sincere. You have to be a person of good conscience. But just being having good conscience, while it's necessary, is not sufficient. Let's try that with teachers. 
Here's a teacher and a student, and she's asked this little boy, which is the largest state in the United States? Well, of course, we know that it used to be Texas, but now, as much as we Texans hate to admit it, it's Alaska. But this little boy answers, Rhode Island is the largest state. We all know that Rhode Island is not the largest, but the smallest state. And so in our cartoon, to get the point over, we have this teacher saying, well, as long as you're sincere, your answer is acceptable. I have been a student. I've never yet had a, had a teacher who said that being sincere would change a wrong answer into a right one. I've been a teacher myself. I've been a professor in all levels of uh, college and university work. Never one time did I give a person a right answer because I thought he was a sincere student just doesn't work that way. Sincerity is necessary to be a really good student, a really first class, so you need to be sincere. But being sincere doesn't change wrong answers into right ones. What about preachers? Just suppose that here's the treasurer of the local congregation where this man is preaching. And he comes to him and he says, well, it just happens that I made out your check this week for $50 less than it was supposed to be. And I was sincere when I did it. And so the cartoon has the preacher saying, well, if you were sincere, then it's okay, don't worry. I doubt that he'd want to accept that. I rather suspect that he'd either want another check for that extra $50 or having to make it out for the right amount. Or, of course, it might be that he's a loving person and he wants uh, the poor to be fed with that or some other good thing to be done with it. And he may say, well, you were wrong about that, but go ahead and let it pass as it is. But what he will not do is to say that your sincerity changed that wrong check into a right one. Now, friends, I know that you agree with me on that. I just know you do. What about this? What about in mathematics? This is somewhat back to the school situation. We have here the problem, 2 plus 2 equals what? Is it 5 or 4 or 6? And here we have a student saying, Oh, well, as long as I'm sincere, it simply does not matter. Now, everybody knows that knows anything at all about mathematics knows that five is the wrong answer, six is the wrong answer, but four is the right answer. It doesn't matter how sincere you are, that doesn't make five or six the right answer. Which of you would be willing to say, well, anybody sincere than either five or six or a thousand or a hundred or whatever answer you give will be right? And so I reemphasize, of course, we must be sincere. Hypocrisy is condemned. Jesus condemned it in the strongest possible language in Matthew 23. But we can all see that just being sincere is not enough in other realms. All these different realms of farming and preaching and teaching school and being doctors and pharmacists, in none of those did we see that sincerity would change wrong answers into right answers. Now let's turn our attention to religion. Here's the Bible, the Word of God. What about the realm of religion? Is it the only exception? You would think so in our society. You can go around and talk about all of these other things, farmers, doctors, lawyers, pharmacists. Not one of them agrees that sincerity will change wrong answers into right answers. And yet those same people, when they come to religion, many of them, by the thousands, the multiplied millions will say, well, if he's sincere in religion, then everything is okay. We have the Bible here. It teaches what it teaches. Sincerity doesn't change what the Bible teaches into something else. The Bible teaches truth. Sincerity doesn't change truth into error, and it doesn't change error into truth. Think in the Old Testament how David was sincere when he built the Ark of the Covenant to transport that Ark of the Covenant according to 2 Samuel chapter, two verses, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 to 5. He was sincere. He no doubt wanted to do what was right. But God had given instructions as to how that uh, Ark was to be moved. It was to be, uh, there were to be staves, just sticks, put through the rings in the corner of that little uh, Ark of the Covenant. And it was to be carried on the shoulders of the Levites, men of a particular tribe of Israel. It was not to be moved on a cart. Now notice how sincere David is. He wanted to move it and do what was right. 
so much that he had a new cart built in order for it to be moved. But God didn't allow that. When Uzzah put forth his hand as the oxen was dragging it along and he thought it was about to stumble, God struck him dead. That's how serious it was. That is in the Bible to help us to know that God demands sincerity, but that he also demands truth. Our sincerity must lead us to study the Bible so that we are willing to accept what it teaches. Take the case of Moses, a very sincere man, a godly man, a man who wanted to do right. He was sincere when he struck the rock, according to Numbers chapter 20, verses 3 to 11. But God had told him to speak to the rock. And so, you see, he did not obey. A sincere man, but was he pleasing to God? No, he was not. I dare say that upon the pages of this book, this Bible, there is hardly a page, probably a page opening, that you could not find at least something that would teach to you that sincerity alone will not do. Sincerity is necessary, but it won't save you. My friends, you've got to learn the truth. You've got to learn the gospel and obey it. Many of the Jews who crucified Christ were sincere. The Apostle Peter said in speaking to them in the third chapter of the book of Acts, verse 17 said, I know that in ignorance you did it. You see, they did what they thought was right. The Jewish leaders had led them to the acceptance of a falsehood about Jesus Christ. Did that sincerity mean that they were not lost? No, it did not. The Apostle Peter taught them to turn again that your sins may be blotted out. In the second chapter of Acts, the same people are addressed by the, by the Apostle Peter. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God unto you by mighty works and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, even as ye yourselves know, him being delivered up by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Ye by the hand of lawless men did crucify and slay whom God raised up, having loosed the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be holden of it. These people were pricked in their hearts, as Peter said in verse 36 of that second chapter of Acts. Let all the house of Israel therefore know assuredly this, that God hath made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. You see, he had said, you have crucified Jesus of Nazareth through the hands of the Roman soldiers. But he is the Son of God. He is Lord and Christ. He didn't say, now because you were sincere, because you were ignorant of what you were doing, that you weren't guilty of sin. And that's why those people, as they heard that message, were convicted of sin, just as every person today ought to be in similar circumstances. And they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? What did they want to do? What did they want to know? They wanted to know what to do to be saved because they knew they had sinned in, in murdering the Son of God through the hand of the Roman soldiers. You see, friends, sincerity will not change error into, into truth. It will not change sin into obedience. The Ethiopian eunuch, about whom we read in Acts 8, was a sincere man. Had gone all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship, according to the Jewish religion. Riding back home in his chariot, reading from the prophet Isaiah. Philip a faithful man sent by the Lord's servants to go and join himself to the chariot, and he did so, and he found him reading from that passage, and he asked him if he understood what he was reading. He said, how can I except some man should guide me? My friends, this man was sincere. Made all that long journey by chariot from Ethiopia to Jerusalem and was on the way back, and yet he's lost. Peter, I mean, Philip preached to him the gospel of Christ, preached Jesus to him, the Bible taught, and yet when they came to a certain water, the Ethiopian having heard the gospel plan of salvation, that penitent believers in Christ are not saved until they are immersed in water, that they might be saved by the grace of God through the blood of Christ. And so when they came to water, he said, See, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all of your heart, you may. He confessed his faith. Both men got out of the chariot. They both went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And then, and not until then, he went on his way rejoicing. Saul of Tarsus, perhaps the greatest enemy the church ever had, the greatest enemy the Lord ever had, called himself the chief of sinners, gave consent unto the death of Stephen, the great servant of Christ, stood by and held the garments of those who were stoning him to death. 
and yet he was lost. He said in Acts 23 and 1, he'd lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. Yet he was lost. He was lost until he was baptized into Christ. Philip, Ananias, the man sent by the Lord to tell him what to do to be saved, said, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on his name. My friends, you call on the name of the Lord for salvation, not by just lifting up your hands into heaven and crying out, O Lord, save me, but you do it by learning the truth that you must be baptized as a penitent believer. That's what he was told to do. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized. Wash away thy sins, calling on his name. In other words, you call on the name of the Lord for salvation when you are baptized into Christ. We're told in Romans 10, 13 and 14, that the person who calls on the name of the Lord is saved. But you can't call on the name of the Lord unless you first believe. And so between being saved and believing, there's the act of obedience called calling on his name. And we see from Acts 22 that we call on the name of the Lord for salvation when we're baptized. My friends, it's necessary to be sincere. But being sincere is not enough. You must study the truth. You must learn the truth. You must love the truth. You must obey it. When you're baptized, you become a Christian. The Lord adds you to the church for which he died, for which he shed his blood. And then you must be faithful unto death, living the faithful Christian life. And when you do that, heaven will be your home throughout eternity. May God bless you is my sincere prayer.